Hey guys, Pro 1701 here, and today I'm going to be reviewing episode two of The Space Pirates, which is the lone surviving episode of uh, The Space Pirates. Now, I'm not going to be reviewing the whole story. I haven't watched any of the reconstructions. I have read the novelization, which I really actually enjoyed, uh, and I read it recently, so it's still fresh on my mind, so I know what happens in the story. But uh, one of my subscribers, Lance, uh, did send me the Lost in Time box set. Um, <clears throat> which includes episode two of the Space Pirates. And since I enjoyed the novel so much, I thought it would be a unique opportunity to take a glance <coughs> excuse me, at the surviving part of this story to see how what I could see of the story measured up with the kind of mental movie I had made up of my in my head of this story as I was reading it. Because a lot of times when I read, I kind of mentally picture what's happening in my mind. And of course, classic Doctor Who is never going to live up to my imagination and what I can conjure up in my mind. And I really enjoyed the Space Pirates novel. But I was curious, especially considering Space Pirates' reputation. It's just, it has a very bad reputation. Probably uh, consider Bob Holmes's worst story. It's not. Trust me, his worst story involves a giant squid. Um, although the script for that's not bad either. But I actually really enjoyed episode two of the Space Pirates for the most part. My biggest complaint is some of the voices used. The general, the kind of leader of the, the good guys, the, the, the voice he uses, I don't really buy it, or whatever he was doing, I didn't really like it. Especially at first, I was like, oh, we're going to have an episode with voices. But that's, that's definitely not his voice. Now, I adjusted to it. I did adjust to it. By the end of the episode, it's fine. I'd gotten used to it. Also, the voice that Clancy uses. And I've heard that whether or not you like Clancy can make or break this story. Whether you find him funny or whether you find him annoying is going to make or break you on this story. I loved the novelization of him. I thought he was a nice, quirky, but intelligent, very street smart, blue collar character. I really liked him. Um, and here, it's just the voice. I like him, the actor, what the actor is doing with his body language and his physical movements and everything. Uh, I like the makeup on him with the eyebrows and the mustache. I like, I just didn't care for that voice he was doing. I guess it's supposed to be going for a, it's like a, it's like a Scottish Southern drawl. It's like, a, it would be like if a Southerner in the United States was trying to talk Scottish I kept expecting him to go, well, golly, Sergeant Carter. Uh, I sort of adjusted to it. I still don't really care for it. It's probably the most off-putting thing, aside from the woman that runs the planet, the one that runs the planet that, even in the novelization, I picked up very quickly something shady was going on with her. But it's really easy to pick it up here. Like, I wonder if she has blonde hair under that dome, because I was immediately suspicious of her. Just watching what she does with her face, it's like she's not trying to hide this at all. This general guy's not overly perceptive when she's not even looking at him like, of course Clancy wouldn't do that. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Her performance was kind of, her voice didn't do much for me either, but her performance seems a bit, I'm an actress paid to play a part. I didn't believe she was the character. She was just an actor performing the character. <laughs> <clears throat> so she was kind of my least favorite thing about it, but then Clancy's voice kind of bothered me. Everything else about the story I was fine with. I enjoyed what was happening in the story. Again, I've read the story. I know what happens. Uh, it was interesting to me to see the actor playing the kind of second-in-command of the good guys, the one that flies the minnow ship. I believe that's the same actor that plays in Monster of Peladon as the engineer, the somewhat shady engineer. Uh, I think that's the same actor. And I liked him, because he, he did really good playing the engineer in Monster of Peladon. And I like him here in this episode, too. He's doing a good job being the second-in-command, uh, giving his opinion. I, I think he's a good actor from, from these two stories. Uh, the model work looks really good, especially for 62. My one big gripe is the, the space has no stars, and that does drive me bonkers. There's no stars. I don't know if there's an explanation for that. I don't remember the book giving an explanation for that. But there's no stars there. It's just space. Just black. I don't like that. That bugs me. That's more like when the TARDIS goes to some other dimension or something. That irks me. But the actual model work looks good. I actually enjoyed some of the camera shots on the models, the way the models were moving. I did watch the film trims 
that show the model work from episode one as well. And that looks really good with the ship pulling away and the station exploding. Some of it's a little silly, like the fragments sitting there statically and the one kind of zipping away, but it's 62, that's fine. But a lot of the actual ship work when the ships are moving looks really good. The incidental music I really liked. You really notice it uh, at the beginning of the story, especially when the ships are moving, but I really liked some of the incidental music. I didn't notice a lot of them, but when it was there, I was really pleased with it. Most of it early on in episode two. And I was like, yeah, I kind of like what this incidental music's doing. Getting me pumped up a little bit. I like that. <clears throat> now, I've heard people complain that we don't get much of Trout and Jamie and Zoe. They're actually in the episode a decent bit. Yes, they're trapped in that room. But in Z Jamie and Zoe don't get a lot to do. But Troughton is great. Troughton's performance here is phenomenal. I love him in this. It's all those little things Troughton, much like Tom Baker, isn't an actor playing the Doctor. He just becomes the Doctor. He has the, those little nuanced things he does that makes you feel like he just is the character. I'm not watching an actor perform. I'm watching the character, the Doctor, on screen. And it's just the little things, the way he's moving his hands. Troughton does so much with his body language. Something animation struggles to capture, uh, although Macritera did a pretty good job. The animations oftentimes struggle to capture it. Um... And it's why I'm glad for every surviving episode of Troughton we have, even just one episode here, just watching what he's doing with his hands and his body language and his facial expressions and how he kind of, like when he's trying to talk sometimes, the difficulty he has breathing, he'll kind of pause between words like he's taking a breath, all those little things. Every time Troughton is on screen in this episode, I'm just, my eyes are just glued to the screen watching him. He's just so amazing. And when he's coming up with ideas like trying to attach the, the sections magnetically, the looks on his face is like, I've got a screwdriver. And then the part when Jamie, when Zoe's pointing out it might not work, and he's like, Jamie, stop being so negative. Or whatever it is he says there, I love the way he does that. I love the way he does that. Stop being so negative. And then when he finds out it doesn't work and he's trying to reach the controls and he's, oh, oh, the look on his face. It's, I cannot understate just how good Troughton is just in general but even in this episode even in this one little part and when he's stuck in this room his performance is phenomenal the man deserves BAFTAs it's so good um and even Zoe she has a little more to do than Jamie she's good when she has stuff to do um so I, yeah I enjoyed it I thought it was fine my first thought after watching it was I wish I could watch more of this story it's a shame none of the space pirates are in this episode. I didn't I did make a note of that. None of the space pirates were in the episode, so we don't really get to see their performance or anything. But my first thought after watching it was, I wish I could watch more of this story. I loved the novelization. I enjoyed episode two a lot. I wish I could watch more of the story. It's definitely one of those. If, you know, episodes turned up, I know some people would be like, what, new missing episodes are found? Oh, it's the space pirates. I'd be like, the space pirates, yes! Um, I enjoyed it. It's, it was a really good story. Uh, so I liked episode two. I don't know if I'll get around to watching the recons eventually. I don't know how good they are. I know telesnaps don't exist. I know John Cura was either in really bad health or had already passed away at the time this aired or it's he passed away not long after because he stopped doing telesnaps during Mine Robber, I believe. So I don't know what the recons look like. I may try to get through them eventually. But the surviving episode two was a good watch. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I definitely appreciate Lance uh, sending this. Um, I mean, it's worth it just to see episode two alone. Because so much of this box set is a bit redundant these days since um, it was done at a time before uh, Enemy of the World was found, before Web of Fear was found, and we have those episodes now. And then a lot of the other episodes have been remastered and released on Blu-ray, like Evil of the Daleks, Faceless Ones, uh, Abominable Snowmen. Uh, the Crusade. So a lot, in some ways, the set is a bit redundant for some episodes, a, a lot of the episodes. But it's nice to still have the others on here. Like this would have been, this would have had me excited for the episode two of Space Pirates alone because I have been wanting to watch that since reading the novel, so I could compare the two. Because it's really neat reading a TV Doctor Who story, like the novelization of it first, and then going back and watching the episode instead of the other way around. Because if you watch the episode first, like, say, Stones of Blood, I've seen Stones of Blood multiple times, but I recently read the novel, um, your mind is kind of shackled by the TV episode, your memory of the TV episode. 
So your mental image of the story as you're reading it is going to be probably linked in some way to the TV episode. You might just be running the TV episode in your head as you're reading it. Whereas if you read the novelization first, you have no preconceptions of what the TV episode looked like. You have no uh, preconceptions of what the story looks like. So you have no shackles on your imagination and you can just picture the story looking however you want to picture the story looking. And because of that, my uh, mental image of the Space Pirates when I read the novel was really, really good. And then I get to go back later and watch the surviving episode and go, oh, this is different, this is different, okay, neat. And I can compare and contrast what is really two different ways to enjoy this story. Um, so it's worth it for that alone. Also, it gives me the opportunity now whenever I want to watch Celestial Toy Maker, which I've seen Celestial Toy Maker, but if I want to watch episode four, I can watch it on my TV instead of my smaller computer. Um, I, it'll give me an opportunity to watch the surviving episodes of Dalek's Master Plan if I want to watch those instead of having to go through all the recons, which I may do soon. And uh, I can watch the surviving episodes of Wheel in Space on uh, television. I can watch the telesnaps on the computer. So I'm really looking forward to diving into some of that as well. So I definitely appreciate Lance sending this. So, episode two of The Space Pirates. What do you think of it? The Target novel of it, if you've read it. What do you think of it? Comment down below and let me know. If there is anything you would like to send me, um, my P.O. box is down in the description below. I always enjoy getting new things and looking at and reviewing them. I also have a Patreon if you would like to support me that way. There is a link to that down in the description below as well. I want to give a shout out to some of my top tier patrons, Stephen Crane, Colin Coney, and Finn Perkins. I appreciate their support, as I do the support of all of my patrons, some of them who have been with me some time, like J.O.B. Who and The Fly Attractor and Alice Collins. Uh, Thomas, I know Thomas has been with me for a little bit. I appreciate um, him. And uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one or two, uh, but I certainly appreciate uh, Trevor. Yeah, Trevor Hicks has been with me for a while. I certainly appreciate uh, everyone. I also have an Amazon wish list if you would like to support me with anything there. There's a link to that down in the description below. And uh, we are nearing 1,000 subscribers, so if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button. That helps me out as well. Most importantly, thank you for watching.